Greetings, welcome to Electronics 2. This is lecture number 29 and I am Bezal Rosavi. Today we will continue to look at negative feedback and uh, try to solidify our understanding of what we have seen so far and then delve into some of the nice properties that negative feedback provides for us in various systems and in particular in circuits. So today uh, I will first take a look at some examples of uh, applica applications of feedback just so that you know feedback even though it's a very old concept it still has many applications in today's life and um, in today's state of the art design and then uh, we'll go we'll quickly summarize what we have learned so far about feedback so that it's all uh, organized in our mind and then we will jump into the properties of negative feedback all right, but before we go there, let's just uh, look at what we covered last time. We saw that this is our standard negative feedback system uh, where we sense the output, pass it through a feedback network with some K, which is usually less than one. So we simply attenuate this by a factor of K, and then we subtract the result from X. And what we saw was that the closed loop transfer function is given by the open loop gain divided by 1 plus the loop gain. Okay, A1 is called the loop gain. And the key point was here that if the loop gain is much greater than 1, then the closed loop gain simplifies to 1 over k. Right? So this cancels this, we have 1 over k. And the key point here is that now the closed loop gain has only a weak dependence on A1 because we really don't see A1 here. So we saw that if A1 changes by a factor of 2, uh, the closed loop gain changes by a much lesser extent. And that's the beauty of negative feedback. Okay, now before uh, we go into uh, further into the, these concepts, I just wanted to show you some examples of what negative feedback can do for us. It's been uh, useful for many, many decades. So here are some quick examples. Again, you don't have to write these down, uh, just so that you have an idea. Here's an example of what we call the Tau Thomas filter. This is an analog filter used in many applications. This was introduced in the 1960s, but even today we have wide usage for the circuit. And again, without going through what the circuit does, you can see that we have uh, two op amps here, then we have Capacitive feedback, resistive feedback. We have capacitive feedback here. You can identify this as an integrator. And then we also have resistive feedback here. So lots of feedback paths. And studying the circuit, understanding what it does, understanding its issues are all critical components for today's electronic design. Another example is what we call the voltage regulator. A voltage regulator uh, takes a voltage, let's say, from a battery uh, that is not very stable. It can fluctuate, and then it tries to create a voltage that's very stable out here. And that goes to some device that we need, a load. So it could be your cell phone, it could be your laptop, somewhere in there. And you can see, again, without going through the details, that there is a feedback path here consisting of a voltage divider, like what we saw last time an op amp, which performs subtraction between this V ref here and this, and then some other stuff. So again, uh, this benefits from negative feedback. Designing these circuits is not that trivial. Uh, many interesting things can happen here. So we need to have a very good understanding of negative feedback before we can attack uh, these designs. Now, these ideas have been around for a very long time. But even in modern electronic design, modern uh, integrated circuits and semiconductors, we also use feedback extensively. So here is an example of something that a technique that I published some years ago. And you can see here that uh, we have uh, sort of a, like a common source stage, but then we have feedback around it. And this circuit allows us to run at uh, 120 a gigahertz. So to achieve such high frequencies, we have to understand the frequency response of the circuit very well. 
So you can see the small signal model down here. And then we apply this feedback to improve its performance and so forth. So we, have, we benefit greatly from negative feedback here. Similarly, we can look at some other examples of, again, state of the art. So here's another paper for one of my students. And uh, you can see on the left-hand side that uh, we have considered this as an op amp. And then there's the feedback around it. Look, it looks like a capacitor, right? Connecting from the output back to the input. So this is reminiscent of an integrator, right? You have a resistor coming to the input of the op amp. We have a capacitor around the op amp that looks like an integrator. But then some other stuff is going on. And there's a switch here, there's a switch here. So we don't exactly know why these are uh, here and so forth, but you can see that there is feedback. And then this circuit uh, eventually is realized, as you can see on the right-hand side, where we build this amplifier out of uh, something uh, very simple. This amplifier is built out of three gain stages. This stage, this stage, and this stage. These are, of course, familiar. These are simple common source stages. This is a little more complicated, but overall we have an amplifier from here to here. And then we apply that feedback around it. You see this feedback. And then we also have another feedback path. This resistor also provides feedback and so on. So lots of interesting things are happening in the circuit. Okay, so these are some examples so that you can see uh, even though negative feedback is a very old concept, uh, it is still serving us very well after all these years. All right, let's go back to uh, uh, where we were and uh, let's look at, let's summarize what we have learned so far. So summary of uh, feedback concepts. Okay, so I want to make sure that everything is crystallized in our mind before we go deeper into the theory and do more calculations. <clears throat> All right, well, so uh, let's see. Okay, so the, what we saw is that point number one, uh, we sacrifice the open loop gain open loop gain to benefit to benefit <coughs> from negative feedback right if you remember we observed last time that in this equation uh, Ka1 is positive, so the result, the closed loop gain, is always smaller than the open loop gain. So we are sacrificing the gain. When I bought this amplifier, it had a gain of 100. Now I have a gain of maybe 20, right? So I sacrifice gain, but uh, I'm benefiting from some other aspects. In particular, uh, this notion that the closed loop gain now is less sensitive to the variations that A1 may experience. All right, so that's important to remember. We are, we are making some sacrifice in benefiting from the properties of negative feedback. Okay, uh, the next is uh, what we observed was that uh, the feedback signal the feedback signal meaning this signal here, which we call U, right, is a good copy of the input signal, right? Is a good copy, or sometimes we can call it replica, replica of, of the input signal. All right. This was because after we calculated the error here, which is x minus u, we saw that we would like to minimize that error. And in fact, that error was x 
divided by 1 plus k a1, right? 1 plus the loop k. So as the loop k n becomes larger, this error becomes smaller, x and u begin to look alike more. So x and u become good copies of each other, so that's something that we observe. Okay, so now, along the lines of this thought, let's ask one more question. If u is a good copy of x, what can I say about y? Alright, well y is not equal to x, right? And not equal to u in general, because k may not be 1, k might be 0.1. But as we saw in our example last time, k is usually a simple fraction, and it does not have frequency dependence most of the time. So we saw that, for example, we built this out of a resistive divider. Here's an example that we saw last time, right? And we saw that K was just this uh, feedback network here, right? So this feedback network doesn't have much frequency dependence. Uh, it's relatively flat with frequency. And uh, K is less than 1 in this case. So uh, what I can say is that Y which is equal to u over k, right, is also a good copy of x, except that it's scaled up, right? So is a good copy of x, but with a scaling factor. Scaling factor. So, for example, e.g., if k is 0.1, right, if k is 0.1, then y is just u divided by 0.1, so is 10u, and because u is very close to x, y is approximately equal to 10x. So, y is approximately equal to 10x. Okay, so I think the key point that you need to uh, take from here is the following. What this loop is trying to do, most of the time, at all time, if it can, is to make y, make u, a good copy of x, and hence y also a good scaled copy of x. All right, so that's what this loop wants to do, the negative feedback loop. So that's the key result that we want to understand. So the loop wants to make y a good scaled copy of x. Right? Because x and u are close to each other, u and y differ by a factor of k, so x and y are close to each other, except that one is bigger than the other one. So here's the situation, right? So as a function of time, this is x coming into the system, then u is very close to x, right? So let's change the color to maybe this. So u looks like this, so u is close to x, and then y is similar to x, similar to y, to, to u, except that it's taller. So we just have a scaling factor, but otherwise it's a good copy of, uh, of x. So that would be like this. So that's y. Okay? So, so long as we remember that uh, originally when we bought this amplifier, this amplifier could generate an output in proportional to the input, right? But there were some issues with respect to A1. A1 could be process dependent, temperature dependent, actually a bunch of things. It could be frequency dependent, right? But now that we have this negative feedback loop, this loop is measuring this Y and trying to make it, through this uh, action here, trying to make it a good copy of X. Okay, so fundamentally what the loop tries to do is actually make U a good copy of X. All right, that's what the loop is trying to do. But 
It says, well, y and u are just related by a simple factor, k, right? Some resistive division, for example. So if I make u a good copy of x, then y is also a good copy of x, but with a scaling factor, all right? That's a critical point that will help us understand negative feedback very well. All right, so uh, one last point. Uh, so that would be point number four. If ka1, the loop gain is much greater than one, then uh, factors that cause a1, the open loop gain, to vary have less effect on the closed loop gain, right? We've seen this a number of times, and I will keep repeating it because that's the fundamental property that comes with negative feedback, right? So we said, yes, if uh, this is much greater than one, then the closed loop gain is like this. So if we have some factors that are affecting A1, like the temperature, whatever, right, they will have less effect on the closed loop gain. All right. Okay, so um, now if I take an amplifier like this, this is a simple amplifier, right? Uh, a differential pair, maybe. And I say that uh, factors that cause a1 to vary. A1 is the voltage gain of the circuit, right? So what factors do we have? Well, obviously, temperature. So factors. So one, temperature. The temperature uh, at which the circuit operates affects the value of the resistors, maybe the current, etc. right? So that, what else? Mm, supply voltage, right? We saw when we were uh, trying to build current meters that, for example, if I have a current source, the value of the current source can be uh, dependent upon, upon the supply voltage. So if the supply voltage goes up and down, you start with a battery in your phone. The battery starts out when it's charged at, let's say, 3.6 volts. But then by the end of the day, it has reached 3 volts or lower. So the supply voltage is changing, that means that, for example, the gain of the circuit might be changing. Okay, what else? Uh, well, frequency, right? Frequency. Do you agree that the gain of the circuit depends on frequency? Right, whether you look at the half circuit or the whole thing, we talked about frequency response of the circuits before, and what we saw was that uh, the voltage gain, or more specifically, V out over V in magnitude, right, was the function of frequency, right? So we had a, const a relatively constant value up to uh, the first pole, and then we started changing. Okay, uh, what else can affect this free the gain of the circuit? Uh, well, uh, let's suppose that uh, I will just try to draw the half circuit here for simplicity. And I have some load here, RC, right? But then uh, I try to drive a load, like a speaker. So here's a load. Do you agree that the gain of the circuit now depends on RL? Right, so the gain is actually given by minus GM times RC in parallel with RL. So if RL is not there, the gain is just minus G on RC. Once we introduce RL, the gain drops. So we see that the load presented to the amplifier affects the gain. So that's another factor that causes the, the A1 to vary, right? So the load impedance load impedance. Okay, so if you present different loads to the amplifier, 
the gain of the amplifier may go up and down. And that's true. So if you buy this amplifier uh, by itself, and you give it different loads, you connect it to 500 ohms, 100 ohms, 8 ohms, it will have different gains. Okay, so, uh, in summary, what we have discovered is that uh, by virtue of negative feedback, the closed loop gain of the system, which is approximately like this, is relatively independent of the temperature, the supply voltage, the frequency, and the loading impedance, right? So that is very interesting because it's not just that, well, I bought an amplifier uh, and the gain was 500, but then I took another sample and the gain of that sample was 600. Right? It's not just not that, because there are all these other uh, interesting effects that we face in circuit design. And it just shows that uh, negative feedback can provide uh, a relatively uh, weak dependence upon these parameters as far as the closed loop gain is concerned, which is approximately 1 over k. All right? So we will elaborate on these a lot more, especially these, but for now, just keep that in mind that uh, these factors also have less effect on the closed loop gain. All right, moving on, uh, let's see. I wanted to give you another example of. Uh, a feedback circuit. So the only negative feedback circuit that we have seen so far at the circuit level is this, right? We analyzed this last time. Uh, but let's go even farther down to the transistor level and see what we can build. All right? Okay. So I will draw this diagram again. Uh, I like this diagram because that captures everything about negative feedback, right? Okay, so here's our negative feedback system. Uh, we have negative here, that's negative feedback. A1 is assumed to be positive, K is assumed to be positive, and then here's the output. Now, do you remember how we arrived at this topology last time? Well, we uh, put a box around part of the feedback system. So let's see if we can use this blue, we uh, put a box around this, right? And we said this box has two inputs, X and U, and one output, Y. And what it does, it says uh, X minus U, then the result times A1. And we said, oh, well, an op amp can do that, right? So we replaced this whole thing with an op amp, and then we built our K, out of resistors and how we came up with the non-inverting amplifier. All right, so let's look for some other circuit that can substitute for this, right? So I'm looking for a circuit that has two inputs, and what it does, it can find the difference between these two voltages. Maybe it could be the currents also, but right now, just voltages. Imagine this is voltage, this is voltage. I'm looking for a device that can find an output, it can produce an output proportional to the difference between two inputs. All right? Okay, so do we know a device that can do that? We need a device that has two inputs, one output, and it can generate an output proportional to the difference between the inputs. All right, so let's think about that. Okay, well, obviously, it cannot be a two-terminal device, right? because we need two inputs, one output. So it has to be a three-terminal device. So diodes cannot do it. Uh, resistors and capacitors cannot do it. Inductors cannot do it. Uh, maybe a transistor can do it. OK, well, uh, let's draw a transistor and see. We can draw a MOSFET. We can draw a bipolar device, really the same thing. Let's draw a MOSFET, OK? So here's a MOSFET. And uh, I'm thinking that if I call this V in 1, and I call this V in 2, and I look at this drain current, can this MOSFET do what I'm looking for? So I'm looking for a circuit or a device that takes two inputs, this one and that one, 
and generates an output proportional to V in 1 minus V in 2. Does this device do that? Well, we know that for a MOSFET, uh, we have something like this, right? So the large signal behavior is ID equals 1 half mu N C ox uh, W over L. Then VGS. How much is VGS here? VGS. Gate minus source. So that's V in 2 minus V in 1. And then minus the threshold voltage, right? Squared. So that seems promising, doesn't it? We have a current that has dependence upon V in 2 minus V in 1. So it is actually looking at the difference between the two voltages. Now from a small signal point of view, what can I say here? From a small signal point of view, I know that so for small signal operation, Uh, what I know is this, that ID, the current that the MOSFET generates, is equal to GM times VGS, right? These are all small signal quantities. And then VGS, the small signal voltage difference between source and drain, source and gate, is V in 2 minus V in 1. So that would be GM V in 2 minus V in 1. So that's beautiful, isn't it? We have uh, found a device that generates a current, a small signal current, proportional to the difference between two voltages. So that could go in here, right? Why not? Could go in here, right? So let's go to the next slide and uh, try to see what we can do here. So actually, I'm going to just scroll this up and try to write something right here. So if you're not comfortable with this, we can just quickly draw the small signal model of the MOSFET. So here's what we have, right? And we have V in 2 going to the gate. Uh, then uh, we have V in 1 going to the source. And then this guy says GM times the difference between these two, right? So that would be GM V in 2 minus V in 1. So this just verifies what I just said. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, take uh, this part of a circuit and replace it by a single transistor, right? Uh, the only thing is that I am probably looking for an output voltage, not an output current. So how do I generate an output voltage here? I have a current, a small signal current coming out of the MOSFET. That's a good current. It gives me... Uh, information about V in 1 minus V in 2. So all I need to do is pass it through a resistor to exploit Ohm's law and generate a voltage, right? So that's what we will do. Okay, so uh, let me change the color here so that I can fit everything in that little space. <coughs> so let's go here. Okay, so this little box, right? That little box will be this. It will be a MOSFET. So a MOSFET taking two inputs. So we'll call this X. And uh, uh, this is U, right? This is U. And then this output is a current ID. I will pass it through a resistor, RD. And now that's a voltage. Right? And now I need a K. Where do I get a K? Well, we saw how we did Ks before, right? We used a uh, voltage divider before. So I will use that voltage divider here. And I connect it like this. R1 and R2. So this is Y, or the output voltage. So take a moment to understand what happened, what we did here. And uh, if you think about this very carefully and compare with the circuit from last time. Uh, okay, let me erase this and make it a little cleaner. All right. So 
Uh, last time we said we had a resistive divider like this, and we came like this, right? This was R1, this was R2. And uh, you can see that these two are similar. If I do the following, if I, in my mind I think of the transistor and its load resistor as an op amp, right? I can say this is like this. You agree? The op amp has two inputs, the circuit has two inputs. The op amp has one output, the circuit has one output, a voltage output, and then we built this K around them to build a feedback amplifier. So you can think of this as a uh, what we call poor man's op amp, right? So if you don't have much money to buy an op amp, you can just uh, build it out of a single transistor. Poor man's op amp. All right, so we see that this little circuit here, uh, in fact, can operate like a non-inverting amplifier, as we saw before, even though we have only a single transistor available. Of course, maybe it's not as good as this. Well, that's okay. But just topologically speaking, it's a negative feedback circuit. Okay, so I want to give you a quiz related to circuit. Uh, so let's skip these slides here and uh, go down to a blank page. All right, so here's the quiz. Uh, so we go back and draw that circuit uh, again. Uh, we took the output, we divided it, R1 and R2, RD, and let's call this X, let's call this Y, okay? And let's not worry about channel length modulation. Uh, let's change the color back to black. All right? So, we would like to find the closed loop gain. So, Y over X is how much? And if it simplifies, let's assume that R1 plus R2 is very large. Okay, so I'll give you one minute to think about it. Okay, so what did he get? Well, all right, so we know that this is equal to A1 over 1 plus K A1. How much is A1? A1 is the open loop gain. It's the gain of the circuit before we applied feedback around it, right? So when I bought the circuit, what did it look like? It looked like this, right? It was simple amplifier. You can think of it as a common gate amplifier, right? So this is A1. And we know that the gain of A1 is Gm times Rd if we neglect channel length modulation. So A1 is equal to Gm times Rd. And uh, K is the feedback factor. K is the amount of voltage that we return, U, divided by the output voltage. So U over Y, right? So how much is K? K is U over Y, and just like the op amp example, it's just a voltage divider, right? So that's just R2 over 
R1 plus R2. Okay, so now we just plug these in here, and that tells us that the closed loop gain is equal to uh, GM RD divided by 1 plus R2 over R1 plus R2 times GM RD. Right, so that's the closed loop gain of the circuit. Now, uh, you probably have one or two questions. One is, where did we use this assumption? Or, and a related question was, well, um, yes, before I put the circuit in feedback, I had just a simple transistor with a load resistor, so the gain was GMRD. But when I placed it in the feedback, these resistors do something here. They draw some current, don't they? Even from small signal perspective, right? They draw some current. So won't they affect the overall result and so forth? So these are all sorts of interesting problems that we will have to study much later. Okay, so at this point, we just want to keep it very simple. We avoid all these uh, second order considerations so that we just get the uh, fundamental concept. All right, okay, so uh, we can also try to find the loop gain here. So how much is the loop gain? Well, lo the loop gain is this, uh, this amount, or we can break the loop from here and find the loop gain. So let's do that. Let's quickly do that. We break the loop, we put a test uh, voltage here as we saw last time. We go around the loop and we come back, so R1 and R2, and this is what we call the feedback signal, in this case VF, or anything you want, V, whatever you want. And uh, now, when we are performing the uh, loop gain test, remember we said that the, all the independent sources have to be set to zero. So this input, which is a voltage source, has to be set to zero, so that is zero. Okay, and our objective is to find VF over V test. So the loop gain would be minus VF over V test. And how much is that? All right, well, V test goes in here. It generates a current of GM V test. Why? Because as far as this transistor is concerned, V test is going to its gate and its source is grounded, so it's acting as a common source stage, right? Even though originally we think of this as a common gate stage, as far as the loop gain calculation is concerned, this is just a common source stage. All right, now we have that current, and this current would flow through RD ordinarily, give us a voltage. Uh, but here, well, there's a bit of splitting, right? Some of it goes this way, some of it goes this way. But I assumed that these two resistors have a, a very, very large value, right? So I can say that because this resistor is very large, the current coming from it is negligible. So all of the current flows through RD. So this voltage is approximately equal to GM V test times RD with a negative sign. So I can say that this voltage is approximately equal to minus GM V test times Rd. So this might be a little too much information at this point, right? Why are we making this assumption? It seems that we could calculate this without this approximation, right? It's not a big deal. Sure, we could. But let's just try to keep things simple because I want to uh, convey some points to you, all right? Okay, so this voltage is minus GM V test Rd. How much is this voltage? So voltage divider, so VF is just R2 over the sum times that. So we say that uh, VF is equal to minus GM V test RD up to here. And then we have a voltage divider. So that would be R2 over R1 plus R2. 
So now you can see that Vf over V test with a negative sign gives us uh, Rd, Gm, Rd, R2 over R1 plus R2, which is, of course, the same as what we found here. Okay, so that's the loop gain. All right. Um, let's talk about properties of negative feedback. Uh, 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 they, all the properties come from fundamentally what we said before. So, we're going to talk about properties of uh, negative feedback. All right, so this is the fundamental equation. We know that y over x is equal to a1 over 1 plus k a1 and we know that this is approximately equal to 1 over k if the loop gain k a1 is much greater than 1, right? So this is the fundamental property and these properties that we're going to talk about actually come from here. All right, so property number one, we say gain desensitization. Gain desensitization. What does this mean? It means that the closed loop gain is less sensitive to variations in the temperature and all these things that we talked about than the open loop gain is, right? So y over x is less sensitive. than to temperature, supply, and the list that I showed you on the previous page, than A1 is, right? So the closed loop gain is less sensitive to these variations than the open loop gain is. That's what we call gain desensitization. All right, second property. Bandwidth extension. What this means is that if the original amplifier that I buy, A1, has a certain bandwidth, when I place it in feedback, the bandwidth actually improves. I can get more bandwidth. Of course, it's not free, right? Remember that when we place it in feedback, we sacrifice some gain. So we sacrifice some gain, but we gain more bandwidth. So a greater bandwidth for the closed loop system, right, than the open loop system. So the open loop system has some bandwidth and some gain. The closed loop system has more bandwidth and less gain. All right, so we'll quantify all of these later. But that's what we have. All right. The next interesting property is modification of input and output impedances. Remember in electronics one, we calculated the input and output impedances of various circuits, the common emitter stage, the followers, and all these things, right? <clears throat> well, when we take one of these stages and put it in a negative feedback loop, both the input impedance and the output impedance change. And they change uh, usually in our favor. They become uh, better, better in some respect. So uh, that's why we say that the input and output impedances of the circuit are, uh, are modified, are changed, once we go from the open loop circuit, the basic uh, untamed wild amplifier that I bought, to this overall negative feedback system. Okay, so these are again things that we have to quantify as we go along. All right, and finally, another beautiful advantage of negative feedback is higher linearity. 
Okay? So higher linearity means what exactly? Well, higher linearity means uh, that, uh, for example, if the original system is very nonlinear like this, so let's call this just input and output, right? So this is without feedback. With feedback, it'll be more linear, but uh, also lower, it will be something like this. Right, so it will be more linear across a wider range. And again, these are things that we have to quantify. So in the next lecture, we'll come back to this list and go through every one of them very carefully with some examples uh, so that we can formulate and see exactly how much benefit we get from uh, negative feedback. I will see you next time.